as John Eric said, I'm going to be talking about the impolitics of internationalism, and this is drawn from the book that I've literally, literally just this week, um, finished, handed over to OUP, and um, hopefully that's that done and dusted so it'll be very interesting for me to test this out with you guys a little bit and hopefully we'll be able to talk a bit at the end have a bit of a conversation see what kind of themes or threads come out of it um so uh just a bit more context so i'm focusing particularly on the rise and fall of the international society for socialist studies which was a sort of um, enterprise that was pioneered or set up by the British socialist uh, GBH Cole um, and it included some of the more familiar names from post-war European socialism so Claude Bourdet is going to pop up, um, Leila Basso and Barbara Car Castle, Fenner Brockway, people like that, some of the big quite well-known figures from, um, from sort of the socialist pantheon as it were. But it was also an opportunity where we meet a few of the newer faces that go on to become extremely important, um, particularly, possibly particularly in Britain, but uh, maybe, uh, maybe more widely, especially more recently. So it's a bit of a crucible for figures from the, from the new left, in particular Stuart Hall and Raphael Samuel. Um, and those, they, those, particularly Stuart Hall, was very connected with this particular society. Uh, just before I plunge straight in, I think it might be useful just to give a little bit more of the research context around this chapter. So what, you know, what kind of questions I was asking, my, what large questions I was asking myself and where this sort of fit in. I'm, um, my focus is very much looking at the Cold War and particularly the 1950s, partly from a sort of slightly perverse reason, because most people think it was a pretty boring decade. Daniel Bell is ringing in my ears, the exhaustion of political ideas, um, and that at best people will allow it to be a seedbed for the 1960s, um, although sort of a very, very sort of limited or restricted one. The most iconic piece of political philosophy from that decade is arguably Isaiah Berlin's Two Concepts of Liberty, and for Berlin, who was not exactly, he was a, he was a sort of apologetic Cold War warrior, but he wasn't exactly a full-on defender of the status quo, but even so, we have a very cautious account of the scope for political action coming out of that piece. So all these sort of factors generally put people off doing anything radical and associating it with the, with the 50s, but just to be awkward, I decided, no, there has to be more to it than that. And it's more than just a midwife to the 60s. What I really like about it, and this might be a bit odd for an intellectual historian, is that actually ideas are kind of breaking down. They're all over the place. It's a period of great flux, and this really fascinates me. People, um, some of the traditional languages and descriptive categories, like class, for example, are coming under real pressure. They're no longer sufficient. You've got things like the Soviet, the Great Soviet Experiment, especially post the Khrushchev revelations, becoming thoroughly discredited, things like that. So there's some of the traditional reference points in socialism are breaking down at the same time, liberalism's not looking much better. You've got a fairly timid parliamentary welfare state liberalism, a laborism that's not particularly inspiring or exciting, in Britain certainly. And then you've got, um, and I think Louis Malan details this beautifully in his study of uh, the free world, Cold War America, you've actually got um, sort of an ironic situation in somewhere like America where there's a lot of totalitarian elements to the insistence on, on liberalism. So it's kind of um, a highly paradoxical, confusing period of time where people are trying to invent new ideas, try things out. It's very experimental. That's what I like about it. Lots of people trying things. Nothing really works, but nothing really fails either. It gets recycled elsewhere. And this is the is this was the attraction to me of the International Society for Socialist Studies, um, which was one heck of a mouthful. I think I often wonder maybe it failed just because it couldn't come up with a better name. <laughs> but um, this was the attraction of looking at this. It is a failure, but it's a very interesting failure. Oh, that no, that's no. yours. <laughs> so during this talk, I will be torturing a metaphor of performance. Now, in fact, I think um, I'm doing this for two reasons. Firstly, I think that 
actually as a metaphor, it's more than just an analogy. It does some really useful work in explaining what goes on in activist politics. Um, I'm very influenced here by figures like Jeffrey Alexander or James Ball, who's done a wonderful dramaturgical analysis of the United Nations, which I thoroughly recommend if anyone, if anyone can get hold of it. Um, I think, yeah, so it, it really, it helps me think through how much this activism involves actors, scripts, audiences, how they try and generate sort of performances that people buy into, how they create calls for action that they can continue on with, so that audiences can then continue on with. So it's an important kind of overall concept for me, but more importantly to this particular idea is that I actually think it, is, it comes down to a matter of performance as to the reason why the ISSS failed. I argue that there is a huge disjuncture between what is presented, what is articulated on the front stage, if you like, what is given forth for audiences to consume, and what's going on backstage, which refers to the extent that actors and dramatists are actually buying in to the ideas that they're presenting to people. And I think this is a, there's a sort of quite major disjuncture here between the sort of what the ideas that they're sort of feeling that they um, want to represent of themselves and what they're actually prepared to do um, to achieve them. And I think this reflects a larger problem of this time of sort of still using older vocabularies, older ideas, older formats, but mixing them with new problems and finding that they just don't quite work. So again, this whole mismatch, um, uneasiness, eeriness, uncanniness is, is very much a theme here. Oh, <laughs> it's too many computers. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time actually just setting out the kind of background to this. And I sort of think GDH Cole, he's a really interesting figure in himself. Um, talk a little bit about his liberal socialism and the background he's coming from, how he sort of uh, comes up or why, why the ISSS becomes sort of possible via him. Um, look a bit about, I've put Cold War there, but what I actually mean is a bit of a wider discourse around peace and internationalism that sort of resurges during the Cold War and runs immediately into some problems, and these are the sorts of things that Cole was trying to think through simultaneously, and then just look at some of the milestones, the, the steps that actually um, brought everyone to Paris on the 23rd to the 25th of March, 1956. Um, then I'll talk about the front stage, which is basically, that's actually quite short. It's what the conference, you know, this lovely conference happened. It's what they all resolved on. It's the motions they accepted. Um, but then I shall reveal some of the things that happen behind the scenes. Um, and that then should bring us to the point where we can start talking about the wider idea of internationalism, why it failed in this particular instance, but also if there are any larger themes as to why you know, some of these notions about what it is to be international, to think international, and to work international, um, why, why they sort of didn't work there, and how groups like the First New Left, who I think is, has the most interesting response to this, how groups like this take these ideas on and innovate. So that's roughly the plan. Let's see what happens. Okay, so um, GDH Cole, I'm not sure how familiar everyone will be with him, so I'll, um, I'll rattle through a little bit of biography reasonably quickly. Um, born in 1889, um, goes, he's uh, son of good, solid, middle-class parents from Cambridge, quite close to where I'm from. Um, and uh, Bright kid, goes to Bailey College, uh, reads uh, classical moderations and then reads greats. It's wonderful, glittering, first class degrees in everything. Whilst he's at university, he reads William Morris. And R William Morris is, um, <laughs> is the great sort of inspiration and the absolute founding, um, founding figure behind his socialism. From that point on, he's one for socialism. But it's a very particular kind of socialism. Um, it's totally rooted, and this is a quote that he's really fond, it, it appears in quite a lot of his writing, it's taken directly from Morris, socialism is fellowship, and then this notion that poverty is only the disease, um, is only the symptom, slavery is the disease. So it's, it's a socialism that's very driven, it says if, if poverty is the greatest, e um, sorry, 
slavery is the greatest evil, then liberty, it stands to reason, is the greatest good. So this is a very, this is socialism very built around the idea and the value of liberty. However, for someone like Cole, unlike a figure like Berlin, who is his very close contemporary and takes over from him as the Chile professor, ultimately, so two men quite reasonably close contemporaries, but for Cole, you cannot separate e liberty from equality. These two are inextricably linked. The, the quality of liberty you have in an unequal society is poor and it's insecure. So he's left in the same situation as many figures where he has a very difficult job to do. He wants to enshrine individual liberty, but at the same time he, need, he wants to make the kind of changes that need to be made to redistribute political and economic wealth and resources. Interestingly, one of his first sort of one of the first figures that he really thinks about very carefully, lectures on, it's one of the first people he teaches on when he graduates and becomes <coughs> a, a philosophy lecturer, briefly, um, is Rousseau. Uh, he's fascinated by Rousseau. This isn't a surprise. Um, Rousseau is very much wrestling with the same kind of tensions, and he's very interested in Rousseau, but ultimately critical. Like Rousseau, he comes down to the idea of, okay, well, how we reconcile this as some sort of participatory democracy but the difference between him and Rousseau is he is a pluralist. So therefore, he doesn't agree with notions like the general will or having a very strong consensus-led model of democracy. So he's trying to find sort of, I suppose, what we would now, although he doesn't use this term himself, call sort of conflict, a conflict approach to democracy. And one of the first approaches he does is obviously, and this is the thing he's best known for, it's guild socialism. Um, and guild socialism is as much a theory of kind of democratic organisation, which is what really preoccupies him. Trying to find these forms which allow for individual freedoms but also allow for collective or group action. And guild socialism, um, guilds, uh, this is supposed to be one of the main or most important mechanisms in industrial democracy. It's the closest rival to what was stronger and more popular in France, which was syndicalism. Um, the main difference is it's borrowing, it's importing ideas from the kind of historical notions of guilds as um, organisations which have stronger psychological content. So it's this idea of craft pride and community accountability that's going to stop groups of workers becoming too avaricious and trying to exploit their customers or consumers because you've got this sort of sense of your work being rooting you within a wider community and making you accountable and responsible for that community. So that's the main difference, as far as I can tell, between guilds and syndica um, syndicalism. He spends most of the early 1920s uh, trying to work it all out and famously comes to a point where he's done it all. He, every, how every level of production, distribution, consumption, everything has been beautifully worked out and planned. All these different committees, how many people will be in which committee, how they would circulate between them. And he looked at it all on paper and he realises that whilst it works perfectly in theory, it could never, ever work in practice. And he draws a conclusion. Why? Um, why kind of? Because it would rely on a huge amount of democratic, existing democratic capacity in people. These theories might all technically, as a piece of social engineering, be leaderless, but they would not be democracy. For democracy, there has to be something, I mean, this is him moving towards, I suppose, what you would call a more virtue ethics position, where democracy starts as an ethos, and how you cultivate that ethos is through education. So from about the sort of mid-20s, he's very active in adult workers' education, but he's also very active and interested in political education. He's forever setting up different groups and experimenting. One of these is the cold group that runs throughout the 30s, at Oxford, and it's with his students. Um, he also sets up things like the Socialist Society for Inquiry and Propaganda, New Fabian Research Bureau, Socialist Society. What these do, they do two things. Um, their purpose is twofold. First, they are literally investigating the kinds of things that you would need to, what do people need in order to be able to participate more fully in democracy? So they're sort of practically information finding. 
um, but they're also, in their own right, experiments in education. So, Cole has a whole um, big sort of history and background of setting, setting things up. Right, that's so much for coal. The other sort of element, I think, heading in towards the International Society is just thinking a bit about the larger um, discourse around internationalism and peace that's, um, that's going on. I'm hurtling forward now, leaving <coughs> the 30s, skipping over the war, getting to the post-war period. But obviously we all know that there's, um, there's been a strong dialogue between this idea of peace and internationalism for a long time. Things like the League of Nations are based on the assumption that the only way we will prevent world wars is with international cooperation. Um, that obviously the League of Nations quickly finds that its capacity to enforce its will beyond a sort of talking shop is much limited, so there's this constant quest for new forms which can combine you know, meeting national interests with having actual um, geopolitical clout, as it were. Um, a lot of uh, thinking around world governance and federated models of leadership at this time too, that's all a sort of um, constant background hum that gets more um, louder and stronger at different times. In the post-war years, obviously, this resurges again and does so very strongly. However, it becomes incredibly complicated in the um, Cold War context. Uh, there is a lot of tension in Europe, and I probably don't need to tell anyone here, you'll all know far more about it than I will, but the, um, than I do, but the sort of tensions around Marshall Plan, the extent to which that kind of imposed NATO, um, the extent to which people were willing to, or which the nations of Europe were willing to be dictated to by, um, to by America. At the same time, there's renewed efforts towards forms of European unity going on. Um, there is, of course, the United Nations. This is a fascinating case study, and I would argue one that's probably, um, someone like Cole is watching very closely. Here you've got a group of nations which have brought together um, in the, with the high aspirations, very noble aspirations of never again shall we have a world war, but the, what's the reality? Well, the Cold War means that the two biggest players, Soviet Union and America, will not cooperate with each other, and they are able to use their power to veto the bringing in of other members. So what starts as a brilliant idea, really actually by the skin of its teeth, even comes into existence, and even when it does, it's on a very truncated capacity to act. Um, but even so, there's still this sort of great appetite, this absolute um, persuasion that uh, we need to think international to ensure any kind of peace. Um, in the sort of late 40s, a group of labor backbenchers attempt to, in Britain, attempt to kickstart the crusade for world government. It's a very sort of small initiative, but um, they sort of, they work very hard on it, they take it all the way to Switzerland, they draw up a charter, and just what happens, simply nobody buys into it. So it's again, it's just another one of these sort of enterprises, um, very large common conversation, nobody's quite finding the way to convert it into a practical reality. And that is, I think, um, an important backdrop to Cole's thinking because he's starting to try and work out, well, why are these things constantly going wrong? Um, if the basic concept that we need to sort of break down or erode some of these sort of national boundaries is essential to future peace, you know, why are these organisational forms people are trying continually failing? So, returning to, to Cole, um, after a sort of long period being relatively quiet and demure and doing long stints on certain government committees and uh, behaving, uh, Beatrice Rowe famously, believed that he's, all the radicalism had gone out of him, and that he was, had become a sort of um, committee functionary and little else. Uh, but suddenly in the 1950s, the radical coal reasserts itself and does so with force. So in 1954, oh by the way, he seemed to have a hotline for the new statesman. Like he was, he pretty much uh, guaranteed an article in it pretty much every week in the early 50s. 1954 pamphlet is this socialism, um, that's predominantly an attack on British labour and the limitations of welfare. Um, welfare, he says, well, you have redistributed income to some extent, but you haven't redistributed property. So the structure of hierarchy and class has been altered, but it's not really been changed. 
Um, the other major critique he makes of them is that also welfare state looks backward. It doesn't look forward. You are not anticipating what future um, labour market eco economic need is going to be and you're not actually anticipating the limits within your own system design. And I think anyone in Britain today would say that was pretty, um, uh, pretty foresighted um, at the time and a lot of what he was predicting did indeed come to pass. I digress. Um, so that's the critique there, and he whirls, whirls back into action. He reconvenes the coal group, and at this point, figures like uh, Stuart Hall and S Raphael Samuel are joining. It's a very eclectic group. He doesn't um, bar anyone. So Samuel is at this point a communist, seems to be an ex-communist following the Khrushchev revelations. Hall is very independent. He's socialist, but he's not... He's not, a, he's not a joiner at this point. He doesn't, he doesn't join the Communist Party. Um, and he's attracted to the coal group because of its ecumenical nature, but because it's a broad church. Excuse me. <coughs> so this group is very speculative in nature. It has broad, large conversations. And it is a real crucible for what will become the first new left, not just in terms of the kind of themes that they're talking about, like what's happening to British capitalism, the, sh the, the very early shift from austerity to affluence, um, but they're also actually experimenting with different forms of doing politics. So again, this idea of how can we have all these different positions, all these tribes of socialism, if you like, and not have it just boil down to interfactional fighting all the time. So it's experimental on both levels. In 1955, he, um, he publishes The Future of Socialism. And this is a sort of call to arms, if you like. Um, and he says in it, socialism must revive its international imagination. And it must stand for peace and against colonialism. There's a few things to kind of draw out of this. He specifies international imagination. So what he's already trying to do is mark, um, a mark a form of internationalism that is not the sum of national interests, but also it's not a strong universalism. It's a kind of weak one. It's, a, it's, a sort of, it's humanist, um, but it's giving plenty of space for those two things, peace, anti-colonialism, to be very different in different places. So it's not trying to bring everyone on board to a particular shared program. And he actually says, that's all I'm going to say. For the rest of it, the crusaders themselves must devise what they want to achieve from this. So he's deliberately trying to think of a format whereby no one's going to be overcommitted, but there's plenty of scope for collaboration and cooperation. And I don't think at this point he sees this as being a kind of governmental body either. So it's something else. He's not at this point sure what yet. Um, about a month, a couple of months later, his call is answered by a man called John Rodham, who found who sets up the World Order of Socialism group. This is a London-based group. It's a very small group, um, and it's mostly populated of people who are already socialists of different, various different persuasions. And they're terribly well-meaning and they're terribly earnest, and they have lots of working groups, but the sort of extent of their world socialism seems to be that it kind of acts as a bit of a prefix. So um, one study group is world socialism and town planning. Another study group is world socialism and education. Basically, as long as it's in the title, you're golden. You don't have to worry about knowing anything about um, anybody else's problems. Um, Nevertheless, it's an interesting model. Cole is supportive, but it doesn't come anywhere near meeting the kind of ambition that he's got for this idea. And so he calls a World Socialism Conference um, in Oxford in July 1955. And this is, um, so this is, he calls to join him here. This is where Claude Bourdet becomes involved, Jean Roux. Um, forgive me if I mispronounce these, Lucien Weitz and Marcel Pivert. Um, he's, he's trying to get together, and I think this is quite significant, um, sort of 
the celebrities of European socialism, if you like, because he wants to give this idea a bit of oomph. Um, so joining them, Leila Basso, Gerhard Gleiber from um, Germany, and then there are some interesting roles for students, some of his students. So Clovis Maxud takes the secretarial role. Clovis Maxud is a um, Lebanese-American graduate student who's quite got strong ambitions in um, Lebanese and Syrian politics. And then Stuart is very involved at this conference too. Um, at this point, he's sort of loosely representing or um, standing for the, the West Indies, which he finds quite difficult because he already at this point has quite a conflicted sense of, of what that means to him and he's still working that out. Nevertheless, they hold this conference and in the true spirit of all international conferences, they come to the firm resolution that they must indeed hold another conference. So that's what they do. They commit to having another conference and at this, and they're going to have it in Paris, and at this conference they are going to launch whatever this organisation that they want to attempt to try is. And the road to Paris is reasonably smooth, it's reasonably, um, there's a reasonable agreement. There's just at one point, which uh, it's a small anecdote, but I think, I'll claim it's important, it's probably not, but very from a very early on, some of the different delegations start to act to national stereotypes, shall we say. So Cole receives a letter from Claude Bourdet having a bit of a complaint that there has been a, a malentendu between him and the British contingency because Claude believes that the whole um, conference needs to be on a much stronger theoretical setting, that we need to dig into the theoretical issues of, um, underlying why, what's going on with capitalism, what's going on with the Soviet Union, why socialism isn't, isn't working, whereas the British want to focus on policy. Those empirical Brits just want to do policy making and he's frightened that that will lead everyone into a state of mind where they're not analysing, they're just stating positions, defining positions, like you might in an Oxford philosophy seminar at that time, shall we say. Um, and Cole reassures him, no, 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 this won't happen, but in order to, to in the spirit of compromise, he gives Bourdais an opening um, address where he can uh, plead with everybody to think analytically and not just get too bogged into positions. So, a very small level, you can already see people starting to kind of revert to the usual national sort of positions and, um, and stances. Okay, so the conference takes place, Paris, 23rd to the 25th of March. 44 delegates and around about 10 countries present. Um, two days of very, very intense talking, roughly structured like this. In the morning, there'd be opening addresses from some of the bigger names. Then everyone would be split into different working parties, each addressing a different kind of problem everyone thought was particularly topical. And then the closing forums at the end of both days. At the end of the last day, um, there were a series of motions and resolutions put forward which the conference had to agree on or not as was their will. Um, this is not just gossip, this is important. During the whole thing, Cole's very unwell. Cole's a diabetic. He's um, experiencing quite a lot of ill health at this time anyway. He was um, an older man by this point. So in actual fact, whilst he appears, and I think this is very significant, for the opening and the closing, the points, to return to my theatre metaphor, the points at which the event is a sort of heightened and most dramatic, when it's being most performative in asserting what it thinks it wants its audience to know about it, he's there. But the bits in between, he's confined to his hotel room very unwell. So he misses a lot of what's going on in the different working parties, what's going on in the tea breaks, what's going on in the lunch break, which, as we all know, is where a lot of stuff gets done at any sort of international conference. So he misses all those. Nevertheless, after these two days of discussions, um, the um, conference adopts the following resolutions. Socialism is international. It must be international. It is an international conference. Socialism must commit to absolute equality between races and nations. Socialism must abolish classes. You'll, um, that is probably the only thing they, they actually got sort of forcibly inserted back in, whereas Cole had been sort of ginger about that, it had been part of what he had 
um, discussed before in his, some of his earlier articles, but really he's only categoric about this. This is more in the background. So that's the only thing that seems to be really different from what's all, what, what he's already written, what's already been said in Oxford. And then the other thing, which is a bit of a tweak, socialists must avoid both NATO and the Soviet Union, which is um, which is a sort of interesting, interesting, probably quite difficult choice to, to make, but there you go. Those are the resolutions they adopted. Again, really not that much different to what Cole had already said. You got to wonder what on earth they spent their time really talking about. We will soon find out. Now, Cole, um, concludes by proposing a motion. The need to create, as soon as possible, a small, informal organisation as individuals, as individuals, with no commitment of parties or other organisations, which would support all efforts to diffuse participation in power and responsibility, to diffuse participation in power and responsibility widely among the people. Um, so this really is his big idea for a sort of an organisational format that's going to perfectly capture his notion of internationalism. So it's quite interesting. For him, internationalism has to be individualistic, which sounds kind of um, counterintuitive, but this is how he perceives it. And he does so for several reasons. Um, his emphasis around individuals means that is weakening the power of the kind of national groups or the sections. So it's not just nations, it's also socialist factions. It's weakening the power of any of those groups to control decisions, right? So they can have those decisions, they can discuss them, but when it comes to any kind of vote, they've not got the power, they, they don't have any power to compel their members. Everyone's got individual discretionary choice. Um, and also the fact that they're not really committing to any program tougher or stronger, I mean, if you think about some of the previous world socialist movements, like, um, you know, the international, like the international, you know, that's obviously committing people to a very sort of robust, categoric program. This is very loose. Um, and, by, and that, for coal, means that you can have conflict, but it's going to be low-risk conflict. It's not going to be conflict like you're seeing in the United Nations, which then thwarts all possible action. It's going to be creative, constructive forms of conflict. Incidentally, um, I sort of should probably pull out too, but his focus on um, peace and anti-colonialism is both sort of ethical, obviously, moral, but it is also practical. He is convinced that actually this is the direction that global power is travelling in, um, especially if you want to think about how about these mass, uh, these large bloc military alliances and also what's happening with capitalism. He's a strong, he argues very, very strongly that capitalism might feel like it's um, be become more humane in places like Britain, but he's one of the strongest voices to say, well, actually, all that's happened is the exploitation has been pushed out to other places. So he's, you know, so he's trying to sort of think across multiple levels here. So this motion is accepted and the International Society for Socialist Studies is officially inaugurated and they whiz off and they appoint themselves an exec executive committee and they um, make plans for yet more meetings and it all seems um, jolly good. And Cole is very pleased with it. He writes to people, things really got going. Um, I'm delighted. However, a couple of weeks later, he gets a letter from Carlo Doglio, who was, he attended, Carlo Doglio is an Italian journalist, he attended the conference with the Italian group, but actually he sort of first encountered Cole and got involved, because he was a member of Wadi's World Socialist Order. Um, and incidentally, none of those people, John Rodham or any of those in that liquor group um, in London, they're not invited, they're not involved, although Cole lets, tells them about it afterwards, and actually, Sort of compels them to say, right, you've got to convert yourself into the British, into a British chapter of the ISSS. Carl Doglio, Carlo Doglio, a few things to know. He's very closely connected to the Freedom Press Anarchist Group, which means that he's really interested in these decentralised, loose forms of um, organisation. Um, and he's uh, he's actually sort of very positive.
excited and enthusiastic about the World Socialist Order. He thinks it, it's the kind of model that could work. They just need to be able to reach out and attract more people. But he writes to Cole to tell him what went on whilst he was in upstairs in his room incapacitated. And he tells him there were three positions operating at that conference. First, there was your one, which was extracted from your articles and from your writings and your speeches and all that sort of thing. And that's the proper and right one that everyone was formally, you know, sort of t towing the line, going along with. But then, outside of those moments, actually there were people like Clovis Maksud and Claude Bourdais who were using the venture purely to pursue their own personal political ambitions. Clovis Maksud, for example, was undermining your notions of internationalism because he kept saying that actually for, um, for colonised people there's a huge revolutionary potential in nationalist movements, so you know, we've got to sort of make sure we can accommodate that too and we've got to recognise that. Um, and Claude Bourdais was, you know, sort of very concerned with what are you going to do with um, how to sort of regenerate, reinvent um, French socialism. He's had a slightly unexpected conversion back to Catholicism, which he was trying to reconcile with at this time, and also becoming increasingly interested in very existential, um, sort of philosophical ideas. So he was sort of doing a lot of counting of those sort of things, and Doglet thought that this was totally self-serving. Then there were the British Labour MPs who were explicit that they were only there in a parliamentary capacity and that they were purely, I mean, Barbara Cass is one, I'm, I'm, I'm only here to meet Lalo, that's it. And Doglio is quite, I mean, I suppose you might, you might feel a bit slightly naive, but he's actually genuinely shocked about this because he genuinely thinks that this is going, this is the inauguration of a whole new sort of approach, a whole new way of doing kind of international politics and activism. And uh, he concludes that, so, you know, what, what this all resulted in is nobody was properly talking about the issues at hand, the kind of things that are really going to get us to where you say you want to be. No one's developing these ideas. We got a conclusion that practically delayed any other decision to a next conference. We're just going to be stuck in conference after conference after conference. Um, and Cole writes back sort of very politely, but slightly dismissively. And already you can sort of sense that even in his own head, he's already starting to wonder whether this is actually going to work. He says, well, look, MPs will always be MPs and you always need them, you know, and you have to have them involved. Um, and Claude Bourdais is a sincere and honest comrade. I don't want to hear a word against him. Clovis Maxwood is completely right. There is a lot of revolutionary potential in those nationalist movements. It's what we do, it's how we work with them and where we go next that matters. So he pacifies and sort of contains the issue. He doesn't really address it. And sure enough, what's the sort of end result? Well, from that point on, things really kind of fizzle out fast. Um, from by late 1956, they'd only had 37 membership inquiries from around the world from individuals interested in joining. They only had groups, confirmed groups, set up in the UK and France. There were promises of things happening in New Zealand and Italy and Germany, but none of the papers I've read have I ever found that these sort of amounted to anything. They have another conference in London in 1957. Um, interestingly, they don't table any non-British speakers for the platform. This is kind of a bit odd. Um, it is just uh, William Warby, who is a British Labour MP, a slightly obscure one at that too. Um, so yeah, it's a very sort of strange kind of follow-up to an international conference. But then what is interesting is that after this point, it's sort of, there is a sort of springtime, an outpouring of other kinds of experiments among the left across Europe, but I'll focus on the ones um, sort of in Britain just for the just for now. And what's interesting about these is everyone wants to rethink socialism, everyone's really excited to do it, and everyone's borrowing very, very similar approaches to them. They're very much based on these kind of notions of a sort of uh, how you have collective action without over committing to any sort of defined program. So they've got this strong sort of participatory democracy vibe going on throughout them. You've got things like the movement for collective action, victory for socialism, John Berger's uh, Geneva group, 
You've got the Socialist Forum, that was revived by Michael <laughs> Seagal. But above all, you've got the New Left. And eventually, the New Left comes to kind of supersede all these other ones. All the different individuals who are involved in them end up sort of being caught up and caught into the New Left's orbit. And I think there are some um, pretty interesting reasons why, which I'll come to in a minute. Cole dies in 1959, and to be honest, by that point, I mean, he dies in January, and the ISSS really doesn't live much longer after that. After that, it's sort of, the, you know, all these groups kind of diffuse off. Nothing ever goes away. It just sort of joins up with other sort of configurations and, conf um, configurations and sort of reinvents itself that way. But the new left, I think, is really significant because I think that people like Stuart Hall and Raphael Samuel think a lot about things like the ISSS and what went wrong and how and why. And they try and think through and around some of the issues. Now, the main issue is that there's nothing wrong with a lot of these ideas. This notion of putting, you know, moving towards a much more democratic socialism on a very firm footing of kind of active participation. But when you do things like your new democratic socialist organization, when the first thing you want to do is go and source all the big political celebrities from the big parties, from the nation, and have all these national representatives who are then told, oh, you're not here to represent the nation, um, then straight away you've sort of set yourself up for failure. So the new left makes some really interesting innovations on some of these ideas. They take the basic concept and <coughs> then they innovate with it. And I think that innovation looks a little something like this. So I'm calling it internationalism. That's not the right term because that's a bit like intersectionality. It's like the sum total of small nations clashing with each other. And this was not a sum total model. It was far more deconstructed than that. But I'll just leave that there for now. If anyone can think of a better term for it, please do let me know. Um, so people like Hall and Samuel, right, Acting international in those international forums, in the whole theatre of it all, in the big sort of elaborate conferences, it pretty much from the get-go reinforces national identity rather than erodes it, even when you are telling people that they're, they're there as individuals not to represent their nation. They almost invariably do not listen to you. So the World Socialist Order, this little group, in actually what, you know, a very cosmopolitan city like London, where they can get people like Italian journalists next to British socialists, no problem at all. Um, that's got promise, but the problem was, again, it appealed to a different kind of nation. The, the many tribes of socialism, if you like. So all it was getting was all the usual characters who were having the same fights, and nothing creative or generative was coming from this. So, so this is, this is, this is, an interesting, it's got potential, but it needs work. So what the new left do, and you know, obviously, this is, this is I think, particularly the universities and left review group, so not your E.P. Thompson's and your John Savills, this is your Stuart Halls, Raphael Samuels, Charles Taylor, and Gabriel Pearson. But they try a few experiments of their own through their club network, which is directly inspired by Cole. Both Hall and Samuel go and see Cole and consult his advice before they set it up. So it's absolutely direct, um, direct influence. For a start, they, they get very interested in how they reach, engage with unpoli unpolitical, their term, unpolitical agents, ordinary people. And by ordinary people, they don't mean like George Orwell's working classes. They mean simply people who do not hold political office nor aspire to. They're not members of parties. It's never really occurred to them to be so. Um, or either that or people that just haven't accumulated much political baggage yet. That's why there's such a strong, that and the fact they're graduate students themselves, there's a strong influence on students, but also young people. Um, so these are the kind of people they're interested in working with. That actually means they can't sit back. They have to go out to people. Um, they are much more proactive. It's sort of almost like rather than becoming a kind of center that the people, that the people come to, they have a far more itinerant or dispersed model where they go out all over the place um, into different kinds of community, or they try to at least. They change the idea, they sort of play with the idea of locality more. And this is a very kind of, I think this is very inspired by Cole. Locality ceases to have a strong kind of identity overtone, like it certainly does 
with someone like E.G. Thompson, for, for example. Um, locality tends to be far more about context for engagement. It's a framework, it's a space, it's, it produces a set of problems that you can work on together which is functional. So your cooperation doesn't need to be based on a general will or a common identity. You can all have something you want to achieve in common, so function. Um, and then they get very interested in different kinds of cosmopolitan locales, like the modern city, London, obviously, they do an awful lot in London. Um, Manchester's got a very strong group. Edinburgh's got a very strong group. Again, anywhere sort of that it's hard to, that there are itinerant populations, people coming and going, or what's extremely important to them is newly formed communities or shifting social formations. Notting Hill is an incredibly important space for them, precisely because that is a community undergoing a massive period of flux. Now, interestingly, their, their, their efforts in Notting Hill um, are very complicated. A lot of them fail. Um, but to them, that's, failure is never a failure. It's actually really interesting to them. Where their efforts don't work is more interesting to them than when the usual standard things that socialists do just... Um, come off. So Notting Hill, the new towns as well, whole new suburbs and communities, they become really fascinated by them, they go into them, they spend ages talking to people. Sometimes that is all they do. They go around asking people questions about what they think and how they feel. And that is to them a huge source of fascination and it might not feel like practical socialism, but to them it is. And then finally, of course, youth. They spend an awful lot of time with not just students, but actually talking to teenagers, the teddy boys, the youth gangs, the juvenile delinquents. Um, this, this here again is another shifting social formation who's finding themselves you know, betwixt and between different kinds of identity and identity clashes. So, that w so just to sort of bring it all back together, I think that the new left are hugely inspired by a lot of the instincts in something like the International Society for Socialist Studies, but they can see its flaws. And its flaws are simple. It's still got a hand back in the 30s or even beyond that into sort of aspirations and forms of internationalism um, that use certain ways or patterns of working. And what the new left diagnose is that your ideas are right, but your designs are wrong. We need to think far more creatively about how we're being socialists. And socialism has got to now cease to be just a proper noun, and it's got to be far more adjectival. And that's actually um, the big challenge that they attempt. In the 50s, they attempt to address. When you get to the 60s, actually, there's a much more return to a, um, a kind of a politics of positionality. And there's much less interest in how you make all this difference work.